Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, for what promises to be a, a uh, interesting and, and timely discussion. This has been uh, something uh, that has been a long time coming, to be honest. We've uh, hoped to have Emilio uh, Archila here to speak in London uh, well before COVID. Uh, he was here in town, uh, but we really wanted to uh, present him and introduce him to uh, the Chatham House Network. Uh, now, luckily, uh, I guess under COVID, we can broaden that network and those who can attend through Zoom. And uh, it's a delight to have him here uh, to speak about uh, the peace process in Colombia and also to initiate what I think and hope will be a long-term collaboration uh, with the Colombian Embassy and the Ambassador uh, Ardila here in, in London as well. Uh, let me start off by thanking the funders of the Latin American Initiative, Diageo, Fresnillo, HSBC, BTG Pactual, Wintershell DEA, uh, Equinor, and Karen Energy. I'd also like to thank a number of the people that are on the call here that have been instrumental in creating and pushing for the Latin American Initiative at Chatham House. Uh, I, I thank you personally uh, for all of your assistance and help in this. I also thank, I think, uh, on behalf of Latin America, that now because of you, uh, Latin America and governments and activists and scholars have a voice in Chatham House. So thank you very much for your support in this. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce our two speakers. Uh, Emilio Archila is the, uh, basically the special advisor to the president for uh, stabilization and peace over and consolidation, overseeing the peace process uh, in Colombia. Uh, he will talk for 15 minutes, and then we'll have comments by Anastasia, who is a lecturer in Suffolk, who has done research in Colombia, most recently, actually, in, as of February. She was in Colombia doing research uh, in, on the ground, uh, which is something very rare when people often like to opine over Colombia. Very rarely are they actually in the, on the ground uh, meeting with people and uh, uh, stakeholders that are there. Uh, and what I really like about her perspective on this is she brings a comparative perspective on peace processes and conflict and post-conflict from her work earlier uh, in Georgia, the country, not the state, although given the events in the United States, I think we may need her in the state of Georgia as soon, well, uh, soon as well, uh, as well as in the caucuses. So it's a real delight uh, to welcome all of you. I'll only say just a few opening remarks about uh, the peace process uh, in Colombia. It has been controversial. Uh, it has been deeply political and deeply polarizing. And we certainly hear on one side a steady drumbeat about the difficulties in its implementation uh, and a fair amount often of uh, blame apportionment. Uh, perhaps that is because of the rhetoric that accompanied the lead up to the uh, referendum and to the congressional vote and later to the presidential vote that elected uh, President Ivan Duque. Um, but certainly, and because of that, uh, we've, we've heard uh, a number of details about difficulties in the implementation of the plan. The Kroc Center at Notre Dame University recently said that only 30% of the peace agreement deals were implemented. But by the same token, what it left out was a lot of those hadn't been implemented even before the arrival of President Ivan Duque. It was at best, uh, and perhaps it's a very ambitious peace agreement that dealt with issues of land redistribution, injection of uh, production and infrastructure into areas that had long been ignored by the Colombian state and it contributed to the conflict. It had uh, very controversially uh, an element of reconciliation and justice and the creation of courts to address this. Um, and it also, of course, dealt with the disarming of a guerrilla group that oftentimes is referred to Marxist as Marxist, I would refer, I would say that it's long ago left its Marxist antecedents and become a criminal uh, or extortion group uh, in Colombia. And so the question is not just one of integrating a group of former combatants. In many cases, it's integrating a group of former uh, criminal networks uh, and, and, and addressing them and laying down their arms. And of course, most recently, we've seen a number of those FARC remnants uh, break off and become uh, openly uh, criminal elements engaging in extortion, narcotics trafficking, and other forms of illicit activities. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to Emilio uh, Archila, who will talk a little bit about the process of peace uh, implementation from the perspective of the Duque government. Mr. Archila. 
Okay, so um, thank you, thank you very much for the for the invitation and the and the opportunity. The, the uh, members of the parliament, uh, the academia, private sector, NGOs, the media. Uh, thank you to uh, Ambassador Ardila, for uh, uh, to you, Chris uh, and uh, Anastasia. Um, this is a very relevant opportunity for for us. I will. Uh, I mean, I, I, I will recall that uh, we were uh, together like uh, maybe one year ago, and uh, one year ago we were uh, talking about the fears that uh, everybody had, because uh, it was thought that uh, the President Duque administration had come uh, to uh, destroy the the agreements, and uh, I can uh, I can assure that uh, that is definitely not what had happened. Uh, Elsa, uh, from the politics, we all understand that this is going to continue to be very controversial. So there are the, uh, a lot of people in Colombia the, whose uh, political uh, flag is the, that uh, once they come to the government, they will, uh, in fact, uh, uh, apply the, uh, the agreements and that we're not doing it, but uh, that's pure politics. So uh, uh, I would like to um, uh, to bring some facts so that uh, it is um, uh, it is so evident that it is uh, for us that President Duque has one the political uh, decision and commitment uh, to comply. We understand uh, that uh, this is something that is binding for the Colombian state, that is binding for the Colombian government, and that uh, it embraces uh, a, a lot of issues uh, that the Colombian uh, people should have uh, faced uh, with or without the, the agreements uh, a long, long time ago. Then uh, a second uh, characteristic is that uh, President Duque has committed all of us uh, to uh, make uh, long-term plans so that uh, in every aspect of the agreement, we are able to take advantage of the fact that this needs to be done by this administration, a second administration, and a third administration. So Colombia has this one opportunity to make the changes, the profound changes that we have not been able to do in the past, in part because uh, we do not have this long-term uh, view. And third, that uh, in each, uh, uh, each one of the areas we have achieved uh, during these 20 months more than uh, uh, could have been expected. One, uh, one area is uh, the political guarantees. And uh, um, we have to understand that uh, in uh, less than three years, the Colombian state modified its constitution, enabled the FARC party members to go to Congress. They are in Congress. They are exercising the, their, their, their rights and continue to do, to do so. We had uh, in the last uh, October the most peaceful local elections in the 60 years of the history of, uh, of Colombia. And uh, we had the FARC participating. We protected uh, the FARC. Uh, I was responsible for the coordination of the protection of the FARC party members, and no one of them were either kidnapped or killed. They uh, participated, they participated freely, and they got uh, um, the, the, uh, as many people uh, elected as uh, as um, people voted uh, voted for them. In in the case of uh, of Ireland, uh, it took uh, at least ten years in order for them to understand that that was needed, and uh, they are uh, just beginning to uh, to implement uh, the political guarantees. We have uh, within these uh, these three years, we changed our constitution. We uh, created uh, the three entities of the transitional justice. We have uh, uh, we have them financing uh, financed. We have them uh, working. They are uh, operative, and uh, that is uh, that is something that uh, in the previous cases now had taken more than uh, ten to fifteen years, so that they understand that they need a transitional justice. Uh, the uh, Colombian government, we work uh, jointly with uh, with respect, with uh, uh, respect uh, their, their autonomy. Even within uh, this period, uh, um, 
Minister Carrasquilla has granted them with the full amount of the financing, and uh, they has been uh, uh, they they are being op they, 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 they are very operative. Then it comes to uh, the responsibilities of uh, of the government, and uh, the way that uh, that I will describe this is that. Uh, uh, the voting of the referendum created a fantasy that signing an agreement produces peace. <laughs> that is, uh, I mean, that, that is, uh, that, that is simply, uh, I mean, uh, 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 too optimistic to put it uh, to put it that way. Uh, the, the implementation of the agreements is uh, has always been thought uh, that it will uh, require and will need uh, at least uh, these 15 years, and uh, we have understood that, and uh, we have understood it in the all the uh, all the fronts. We understand that we will need to continue to work for the victims. The victims are in the core of the agreement. Uh, the law was supposed to come to an end in uh, December 2021. We understand that uh, we need to accompany the more than 9 million Colombians that continue to need uh, support. So we have already said that we are going to extend uh, the, uh, that law for as necessary uh, as we need. In this time, uh, we have been uh, uh, awarding the victims individually at a rate that is at least 20% uh, more efficient than uh, what it has done in the past days, in the past five years, in uh, relation to a uh, collective compensation. When we came to office, there was just uh, 14 compensations and in just 20 months we have awarded 16. This is uh, this is uh, the same with uh, ex combats uh, By some reason or other, uh, everything was thought that uh, was coming to an end in uh, August of last year. Uh, the financial support will come, will have come to an end. The health support would have come to an end. Uh, the administration of the places where at least three thousand of them lived will come to an end. We understand that that is not going to happen. We understand that uh, we need to support the ex-combats for as long as it is needed, uh, so long as that they continue within the reincorporation process. We uh, created uh, the reincorporation route. We uh, bargained this with the, with the FARC and we issued it in December of last year. We um, renewed uh, our commitment uh, to provide them with uh, financial support. We renewed our commitment to continue with uh, the special health uh, schemes. We renewed our commitment to provide them with, uh, with food and resources. Uh, in the, during these uh, 20 months, <clears throat> we have been able to uh, incorporate 98% of them in the Colombian financial system more than 85% of them uh, in the Colombian health system that has been very useful to, to face the, the pandemic. More than 88% are already in the Colombian pension uh, funds. Um, we uh, have provided them with 1,300 uh, economic projects, individual projects. We have uh, been able to provide them with uh, at least 80 economic projects, collective projects. This is the ones that uh, embrace uh, more or less uh, 15 or 20 of the ex comments. There is, uh, there is uh, no place in Colombia that is uh, at, at that level of, of entrepreneurship. This is 13,000 people. And uh, if, uh, if I was the mayor of, uh, of a town of uh, 13,000 uh, heads uh, uh, households, and uh, we have uh, that amount of coverage and that amount of entrepreneurship, that will be the most successful town in the whole country. We uh, understand that uh, we need to um, uh, renew the areas that were more affected by violence and, and poverty. This is 170 municipalities in Colombia. That's one third of our territory. And uh, believe me, uh, the Colombian territory can be very difficult to work with. 
they are embraced, uh, they are grouped in uh, 16 regions. Uh, when we arrived to government, we had two plans. Now we have uh, finished uh, the 16 uh, development plans with territorial emphasis, and we are working in compliance with, uh, with those. We uh, changed uh, the rules for uh, some of the, um, um, uh, uh, the resources, that's the 7% of the royalties of gas and oil, and um, 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 a tax instrument that we call work for taxes that enable the private parties to come and work with us. Uh, between one and the other, at this moment, we have more than 350 US million dollars in executions in those territories. To, to give you an, uh, an idea, that could be uh, twice the size of the European fund, and the European fund uh, is uh, the support of the European community for all the areas of the, of the implementation for the next uh, uh, four years. Um, besides those, we have uh, the agency of the, the renewal of the territory. They implement uh, the, the interventions that are uh, less complex, and we have delivered 888 uh, of those works uh, during these 20 months. That is delivering uh, more than 1.5 uh, works per day of the administration uh, of the Duque's uh, administration. We do understand that uh, we need to work in the same line in uh, a coca substitution, in voluntary coca substitution. We received a, a very badly planned, not financed program of 100,000 Colombian families that were expecting uh, that the government will give them support. This is uh, worth uh, 3.5 Colombian billion pesos. This is 12 zeros. Uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, a lot of money. And uh, 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 for that, we only received uh, 500,000 million pesos. We have been making a huge effort in order to comply with, uh, with those families. And uh, I can tell you that we have been successful. Less than 1% uh, of those families has gone back uh, to COCA. So at this moment, we can proudly say that we have 400,000 Colombians that were in COCA and that uh, now they are in the way to uh, have a different uh, way of living. For those families, uh, at least 65% of them are already receiving the technical assistance in order to uh, enable them to go to a different kind of, uh, of crops. That is like giving, uh, uh, that, that's like, like providing technical assistance to the whole area of Tumaco in the Pacific uh, of, uh, of Colombia. We do uh, understand that we need to work in what is called uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, rural reform. We uh, decided not to uh, speculate a lot and to get uh, the, our hands in the work. This is something that uh, was always thought that uh, needed uh, uh, 15 years. We can give you an example. Uh, when we arrived uh, to government, uh, the multipurpose catastrophe, what we received was uh, two failures in the Congress to pass a law. We understood that we did not have any need a uh, law. We uh, issued a COMPASS document. COMPASS document is the long-term policy documents in Colombia, and that enabled us to receive a loan by the World Bank of $150 million. With that uh, $150 million, uh, we restructured the IGAC. That was uh, the entity that had the, the monopoly. We issued the laws so that uh, we can uh, at attract uh, third parties to do the, the catastrophe. We are going to be able to formalize at least 80% of the uh, 80, uh, 80 uh, municipalities, half of them being pedet municipalities. And I can, uh, I can tell you that what, the way that we are doing things is the correct one. The reason why I uh, am so sure is because uh, we have attracted uh, the Americans. US uh, aid is going to help us with at least 
other 10 uh, municipalities. We have attracted uh, the UK. Uh, this is one of the areas where we are going to receive the, uh, a very big support uh, of our bilateral uh, uh, help. We have attracted uh, the Netherlands. We have uh, in place uh, the uh, Colombia Rural, that's uh, the program to provide uh, with uh, tertiary roads. We have uh, um, um, uh, uh, Agual Campo, this is uh, water to, uh, uh, to the countryside uh, by Ministry uh, Malagón. We have uh, renewed uh, the uh, rural health uh, scheme with uh, at least uh, twice as much as resources as the ones that, uh, that we received. We, had, uh, we have a commitment to, um, to put into the land bank uh, 3 million hectares uh, in 12 years. And in these 20 months, we have provided for 1 million hectares. We have uh, formalized more than uh, 500,000 uh, um, uh, hectares uh, for the people uh, with the, the need of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of land, and we will continue to go in the same, uh, in the same path. So I will uh, um, finish um, uh, maybe by uh, just uh, calling the, the attention uh, that when we work uh, with the, the Kroc Institute, I have insisted uh, to them to remember how long uh, the task, each task will, will take. Because uh, there are the, some aspects of the implementation that are uh, very relevant, but they are complied with in one or two weeks. The surrender of the arms was absolutely uh, necessary. It is uh, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the start, in the core, it gave uh, the birth uh, to the possibility of us to have, uh, to have peace, but you, you surrender the arms in two weeks. That's what it takes. Uh, then uh, you need to um, uh, transform uh, the territories and people that uh, think that uh, the territories can be transformed uh, in uh, just a few months, they are either naive or liars. Um, and uh, just, uh, I mean, in, uh, in, in what has to do with water supply, Colombia has 98% uh, of, uh, of coverage. That's like living in London. Very good, because uh, most Colombians live in live in the in the in, in the cities, and in the cities it is 100% coverage. When you go to uh, um, uh, to the rural areas, it will be 40%. That's not good. That's like uh, an uh, African average country. But when you go to the uh, Pedete municipalities, uh, the, the, the most affected by violence and, uh, and poverty, it is just 10%. And uh, it is 10% of coverage in an area that represents uh, the third part of, uh, of our territory. So our plan is that uh, we will be able to uh, elevate that percentage to 98% by 2031. So it is, uh, it, it is sad, but the, the only thing that it is uh, saddest uh, is that uh, it would have not uh, started. So we, we understand uh, the opportunity, we understand that we need to work, we understand that we need to make the long-term plans. And I do think that uh, President Duque is being uh, very historically responsible by making these plans, notwithstanding that uh, uh, the majority of the results will be seen a long time after we have left office. Thank you very much, Emilio. Uh, that was important and it highlights, I think, uh, something that is overlooked often in modern day post-conflict situations that we're not just dealing with sort of inter-ethnic or inter-social conflict, we're dealing with uh, the integration of territories that have long uh, been without state, uh, a state or any rule of law, and that the process of rebuilding uh, peace uh, is one of actually creating a state that hadn't existed before. So on that, let me turn to Anastasia, who will give us a, a, a comparative perspective and a little more uh, take on her uh, recent research in the field in Colombia. Anastasia, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me to be part of this uh, research event and Mr. Archila for the very helpful and comprehensive comments. Um, I will also offer some reflections on these comments and add some additional points um, that I have noticed in the course of my fieldwork in Colombia. It is now widely recognized that this is an unprecedented agreement that showed immediate results and are still showing results. Um, many wars that are settled through peace agreements are, are those that have an agrarian origin. And so the comprehensive territorial approach that the agreement provided is one of the kind of key significant novelties um, in terms of this particular effort, but also the effort of emphasis on collective reincorporation, on transitional justice for all victims, and overall on modernization of the state. It is almost um, a document that provides a road plan for decades going forward for the state in terms of its modernization. So let me zoom into some of the areas of immediate success that uh, were implemented in a fantastic way and um, provided a strong and effective response to this long lasting conflict that took so many lives and displaced more. First, the ceasefire, disarmament and demobilization was a major success immediately with thousands of FARC ex combatants laying down arms and committing to peace. This was done with the support of both the government and the international community. Second, as Mr. Archila has noted, over 13,000 FARC ex-combatants have joined the social and economic reincorporation process, both through collective and individual routes. And they have both, uh, dis despite of the route, regardless of the route, been supported with technical support, financial support, both from the government and the international community. Third, in terms of political participation, um, as Mr. Archula has noted, FARC turned into a political party. Um, this is a highly complex process, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but already the fact that it has guaranteed seats, that it has participated in national elections is a major success. Furthermore, violence did drop in the first year after the agreement. And, and as Mr. Archula noted, the recent elections were one of the most peaceful in decades. These are major achievements among others, but a much more complex picture underlies each of these successes. In terms of demobilization, we know that not all FARC combatants joined the process in 2016 and many remobilized into either FARC dissident groups or other armed groups since the process started. And this is an important part of demobilization that we need to recognize as, as um, potentially affecting the peace in the future. In terms of reincorporation, the territorial areas for training and reintegration that Mr. Archila noted that were supposed to temporarily host um, ex-combatants, many of them are located in highly remote areas with very little access to uh, public services, really poor infrastructure, and they ended up not being temporary. Um, thanks to the efforts of this government, thanks to the realization that some of these um, uh, former ETCRs actually should stay, they are now transitioning into territorial units. But because they are located in the areas where so much armed conflict is still going on, where other armed groups are competing for territorial control and, and the state is, is not much present, this is a major problem going forward. And a welcome uh, advancement here is the fact that pedets overlap so much with the former ETCRs. But only a quarter of ex-combatants, uh, about a quarter, now reside in these former EDCRs and attention should also be drawn to other ex-combatants who have either formed new reincorporation areas that are facing their own difficulties, even with the support provided by the government. These new reincorporation areas are struggling um, dramatically with public services and infrastructure and um, capacities to establish uh, a lifestyle as a community, as a collective. On the other hand, we have roughly a quarter of, of those ex-combatants who left former EDCRs who are now in cities. And for those individuals, the challenge is different. Yes, they do have access to state support. Yes, they, for instance, in the recent, uh, in the pandemic, they have been contact contacted by the ARN, each and one of them, in order to find out what kind of uh, the National Reintegration Agency, what kind of support they need in this context. But 
they constantly highlight that they are missing the collective support that they could have gotten um, if they were uh, to, to remain a part of the community, either in a former EDCR or the new reincorporation area. So these differences are highly important in terms of ensuring successful reincorporation going forward. Furthermore, what we have um, seen actually in multiple countries transitioning out of uh, war is that quite often the focus on on the rank and file in terms of reincorporation and on top leadership in terms of political participation leaves the middle layer, an essential middle layer of mid-level commanders um, without proper attention. These are individuals who occupied a, a particular social status, <laughs> access to um, a leadership in, in the former organization in an armed group and are currently are providing both an opportunity for the peace because they do have leadership skills and are sometimes natural leaders. I've spoken with many of them uh, and who could lead community efforts um, toward peace, for instance, the productive projects, et cetera. But also these individuals, if left without proper attention, might become a threat to the peace um, process because they are what Tilly a long time ago called violence specialists who are highly sought after by other armed groups and who have the skills and capacities to con contribute to those armed groups operations. Furthermore, in terms of political participation, what we know from the rebel to party uh, transitions literature is that it is incredibly difficult to transform out of an armed group, no matter how well disciplined, hierarchical, etc., into a political party that has to compete with old established parties in a system that has its own rules that you really need to get socialized into. And we have seen this setback already. Even though the FARC as a political party enjoys seats and participate in elections, it has had very little electoral success. And more, more so, it's becoming more and more fragmented internally, both in terms of divisions among top leaders and between the top leadership and rank and file. The disconnect is emerging and is being voiced um, by rank and file over and over uh, in conversations that I've had. More importantly, with regard to political participation, however, is the fact of the killings of social leaders and ex-combatants. This is probably the most important area of political participation that requires urgent attention. Um, yes, the numbers are contested. It is difficult to gather data and there's under-reporting on these uh, murders for all kinds of reasons, but we know that over 600 social leaders and over 200 ex-combatants um, and, and their families have been affected um, since the signing of the peace agreement. And at the heart of these murders are efforts to promote implementation of the peace agreement, especially uh, as it relates to land redistribution and illicit economies, um, particularly coca production, but also illegal mining that affects communities in various ways, for instance, by polluting rivers, etc. So this dramatically affects political participation, and I think it is the emphasis on political participation that we need that needs to emerge when we think about these killings of uh, social leaders and, and ex-combatants. This also relates to, of course, broader patterns of violence in the country. From comparative literature, we know that when war ends, it does not mean that peace will emerge. And it means that sometimes, in fact, um, armed confrontation becomes more complex. It intensifies in different ways and it changes in nature. This is somewhat what we have seen in Colombia, where multiple groups, um, ELN being the primary one, but also about 20 groups altogether in different categories that, that we have, have a, a continued to clash with each other, with the military to continue establishing, expanding territorial control, especially in the areas where illicit crop production can take place, where illicit, illicit mining can take place, which is also the areas where most former ETCRs are located and where most pedets are located. So it's a complex overlap of ongoing violence that is facing um, development at the same time. So um, to kind of wrap up the individual comments before I, I um, conclude, 
Yes, indeed. The Special Jurisdiction for Peace, um, which is one of the main institutions of the transitional justice system, has seen uh, more than, what, 12,000 um, people testifying, both former FARC combatants and uh, armed forces, uh, to ensure that all victims are, are treated in equivalent ways uh, from past and from, from past violence. But as a result of the uh, contestation around transitional justice system, uh, polarization of opinions and um, conflict in general over this uh, problem, the institution is struggling with legitimacy and it's incredibly important to continue building legitimacy of sp particularly the special jurisdiction for peace in order for once again all victims across the board to receive uh, justice that they that they deserve. So what we see as a result are a number of incredibly important steps the work on PEDETS, the cadaster or the register of national ter territory, the voluntary substitution of uh, crops are incredibly, the protection, for instance, that is provided to uh, former FARC uh, members who are now in the political party, etc. These are incredibly important steps um, that are necessary for um, long term infrastructure building as exemplified in the 15 year plan for tertiary roads that Mr. Archula noticed, um, which goes to the heart of the underlying sources of conflict, um, namely unequal land tenure that translates into poverty and inequality and urban rural divide. The weak political participation due to continued political polarization and killing of social leaders. The lack of state control over so much of the territory that enables armed group control and access to illicit economies and continued contestation over justice. I find that it is these broader issues that need to continue being at the heart, at the forefront of both discussions and specific um, implementation goals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anastasia, that was fantastic. Uh, and I think it put a very good comparative and theoretical context uh, for this discussion uh, on the table. Um, I, wanna, I wanna tell our, our participants, if you have a question, please hit the raise your hand function, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen, and I'll call on you. I should also let you know that this is um, on the record and it's, this uh, conversation is being recorded um, so it's, uh, please be aware. So that's also relevant to the journalists that I noticed that are on this call. Uh, it is on the record. Um, but before I turn it over to questions and answers, uh, I wanna just see if um, Emilio has any responses. I think there were a number of things that were very relevant uh, that I think he talked about in terms of the operational level, but I'm interested in hearing uh, him discuss those in the context of the broader theoretical implications of, of building legitimacy of institutions, uh, the issues of leadership and, and the challenges of integrating uh, those uh, conflict specialists, uh, as Anastasia quoting uh, Tilly, I assume she meant Charles Tilly, the professor, not, not uh, on Jennifer Tilly, the, the star of the 1998 movie, Chucky's Bride, true story. Um, also the unequal access to land and contestation over justice. So, um, uh, Emilia, Emilio, do you have any responses? A couple of quick views and takes on Anastasia's very good presentation. Yes. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, Anastasia. It's, it's uh, very clear that uh, you know our country uh, in yeah. depth, and uh, uh, in, in particular because uh, usually it's not easy to understand uh, the interlinkage between the, the different processes. Uh, so it, it is it is not that uh, it is not that uh, that the reintegration process is uh, is isolated uh, from the development of uh, the territories and the development of the territories is not uh, uh, isolated from uh, um, the um, uh, the the coming to a uh, uh, a, a sensation of peace between the people that are the, the, the inhabitants of, of those areas. So uh, and, uh, I will um, I will uh, um, try to, um, to 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 point uh, that from the reconciliation aspect, uh, the Colombian uh, process. I mean, every process is unique. 
every process is unique. But in our case, in our case, um, if, 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 if we get rid of the violence, there is no profound and long lasting differences between the Colombians. That's something that it's, it, it, this has not been a, a, a violence between black and white or between people that are Protestants and uh, non-Protestants or, uh, or that we come from different uh, indigenous uh, 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 groups. Uh, we Colombians are, uh, I mean, we, we, we are all the, the same. So what, uh, what, what makes uh, what separated uh, us and continues to do in some parts of the, of the country is the fact that, uh, that there is, a, there is the, the violence. So um, once uh, we understand uh, we understand that, uh, then when we try to think what will in the long term uh, make the, the difference, so that people can reconciliate one with the other, it is very important that we hear their, vo their voices. It is very important that uh, we do not come from Bogota or from London or from uh, New York or California and uh, try to come with uh, very sophisticated theories of uh, how people reconciliate one, uh, one with the other. And we have been making a very big efforts in order to do that. And in practical matters, that means that uh, for the 170 municipalities, we have uh, a whole chapter as, uh, as a strong and as relevant as uh, roads and health and education that we call reconciliation. So we have gone to the territories and we have asked the people, what is it that you think that you need in order to reconciliate? And uh, they have uh, pointed out what is uh, the reconciliation uh, reconciliation path. Not surprisingly, uh, we made uh, this exercise of uh, uh, crossing that with what people uh, ask when they are uh, in the return plan. When they when people are victims, they have been displaced, and then they they say what is it that they will need in order to go back to the territories. It will match uh, almost exactly with uh, what they have uh, said in the reconciliation pillar of the of the Fed, uh, Fed plan. So uh, that th th that is, uh, uh, in my view, uh, relevant because uh, it gives it gives us a light of uh, how things are uh, interconnected uh, one, one once with uh, with the other. Now, in in what has to do with, uh, I mean, with um, a political discussion, I will say that uh, we have like uh, three levels. We have uh, one level that it's uh, pure politics. And pure politics will continue to be politics. No, um, that, that's not good, that, that's not bad, but uh, there are uh, uh, government uh, parties, there are parties that are uh, neutral, and there are uh, parties that are uh, in, the, in the opposition. People in the opposition parties will continue to say that we are not doing things correctly, and that uh, once they come to government uh, in the 2022, then uh, things will start uh, to, uh, to happen. No? That's, uh, that, that's pure politics. Then I will say that um, in many aspects of the, of the implementation, many aspects of the implementation, and I would say that crucial ones, the Colombian people are starting to, uh, to agree. And uh, so, and the reason why I say is because even people in the opposition, they will say that what we are doing in supporting the reconciliation process is okay. And they will uh, say that uh, publicly. The uh, fact that uh, that needs to be done in the long term, uh, it is something that uh, nowadays nobody um, uh, disagrees. Uh, in what it has to do with uh, with the PEDET planning, this is the plans uh, for the 170 municipalities. We have uh, we have reached uh, an, a national agreement. Nowadays, there are no people in Colombia, no the, the political parties, no, no the opposition. Nobody doubts that we need to support these 170 municipalities and we need to take them uh, out of, uh, of, of that condition, of those conditions in order for peace to, to, to last. 
and, uh, and th that is something that, uh, I mean, uh, just uh, 20 months after uh, 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 we came to office and uh, we had this injury that we were going to destroy the, the agreements, I would say that uh, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's significant. Then it comes uh, to transitional justice. And um, I will uh, say in, in this, uh, in this atmosphere that we have now, that it's uh, of, uh, of, of realistic analysis that transitional justice will continue to be controversial forever. That is not something that will end uh, the controversy. And uh, the reason is uh, very, very simple. Uh, the, the, the mere definition of transitional justice is a compromise between justice and peace. So it is, it is a, a society, in our case, the Colombian the people saying, okay, in order to get peace, I am willing to, uh, uh, to punish these kind of crimes in a way that uh, 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 ourselves, we consider that is less than what is really what they deserve. That, that's that, that, that's uh, the, the, underlying, uh, the, the underlying compromise. So this will continue to be controversial uh, uh, for as long as it is needed. And uh, um, I, I don't think that uh, that should uh, bother us uh, a lot. The transitional justice is transitional. It is not something that is meant to endure in, the, in society. So uh, what it is needed is that uh, they can uh, enough legitimacy uh, in order to do their job and uh, the Colombian people to pass, uh, to pass the, 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 the page. Emilio, thank you for that. Uh, one note, I, I like the, um, your, the, the phrase realistic analysis. I think that should be a, a, a tagline for uh, uh, some research. Um, we have a question from Chad. I have a question myself, a question from Chad. And the first, and that is uh, twofold. One is, What's your response to the charges uh, of the 300 plus community activists that have been murdered uh, since the signing of the peace deal? And then what is uh, the responsibility of the government and how is the government responding uh, to those, those murders? I am, not, uh, I am not responsible for the coordination of, uh, of um, the protection of, uh, of social leaders. I am just uh, responsible for the coordination of the protection of uh, ex-combats and uh, people that are leaders uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the voluntary coca substitution. So uh, I will use this, uh, I mean, to illustrate uh, the way that uh, we see this. One thing is that uh, this is, uh, this is a, an issue to which the Colombian government gives a lot of priority and uh, a lot of, uh, and, and, and a lot of, uh, uh, we devote a lot of resources and a, and a lot of time. Um, we do understand that uh, after uh, the FARC left, uh, there was uh, going to, to, I mean, things were going to, to start to, to happen. The places where we have a voluntary substitution of coca are the most remote and most complex uh, places in the Colombian uh, territory. This is more than 52 municipalities, and we need to go in depth, deep into the, uh, in, in, into the territories in order to find the, the, the people. Then after, uh, what we are doing, uh, uh, jointly with these those families is that we are taking uh, uh, out the business of the uh, of the worst criminals that are uh, in uh, in Colombia and in uh, in the world. So it was uh, it was evident uh, to us that um, uh, that we needed to work with them in order to uh, enhance the, the the security. The way that uh, that we do this is that uh, we go to the territories. And with the local leaders, we analyze every uh, possible circumstance uh, of their day-to-day -day life and see what uh, the possible risks are. 
and we coordinate with uh, every agency in the state that has a responsibility for giving protection so that uh, they will enhance the care that, uh, that, they, will, uh, that they will take. Uh, we started in the area of, uh, of Tumaco. Uh, I spent uh, like uh, three or four days uh, there you know, doing this kind of, uh, of work. And um, I do think that uh, uh, in the places where we are working, we have uh, in increased uh, the protection. And now, um, the, the, the realistic analysis is that uh, as long as uh, we continue to have voluntary substitution programs uh, where we are taking the raw materials out of the criminals, this will continue to be a threat to, uh, to their business and that we will need to continue to work with the leaders to protect them uh, so that they can do their work. We have a chat question, but also we have a question from uh, Baroness Hooper. Um, I don't know, uh, Baroness, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, well, I think I am unmuted. You are. Yes. Yes, good. <laughs> um, and, and first of all, to say thank you to our speakers. Uh, they were excellent presentations. Um, my question was about the impact of the resumption in drug trafficking and also the impact of the large number of immigrants, particularly from Venezuela. Um, Emilio touched on, on, on the first issue um, uh, in his last reply. Um, but is there any response to those two issues and the impact that they have had on the, the um, ongoing of the peace process? Go ahead, Emilio. I mean, um, one other particularity of the, of the Colombian process is that uh, we are implementing the agreement with the, with the FARC uh, within a continuously uh, difficult situation derived from narco-trafficking. The, uh, the, 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 the worst uh, threat to the possibility of implementing the agreements is uh, narco-trafficking in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, there are some areas in the, in the country where uh, the Maduro regime is a, uh, it's a real nightmare. Um, I mean, um, I work uh, very close, uh, very intensively in Catatumbo. This is uh, the area that is uh, in, in, the, uh, in the north of Colombia, in the border with, uh, with Venezuela. And there, uh, um, every time that uh, we start to make a, a really strong press into the, the dissidents and the ELN, they will go to the other side of the, of the border and they will be uh, protected by, uh, by Maduro. And uh, obviously uh, having them uh, uh, continue to, uh, uh, to, uh, to perform attacks uh, against uh, uh, our infrastructure and uh, our, uh, our people, that uh, creates not only a, a, a very bad atmosphere, that, uh, but uh, it makes everything more, more costly and more, uh, more difficult. Um, we are working very intensively in the area of Tibu and uh, Sardinata, and there uh, we have uh, again uh, remining going on. And uh, as long as uh, we have remining going on, well, in order to take the, the, the tertiary roads and in order to take the, the, the water supply and things, that uh, uh, starts to, to be uh, much more uh, much more complex. Now, in, in what has to do with, uh, with migration, uh, we, do, we work very uh, jointly with Felipe Muñoz. Felipe Muñoz is uh, the manager for the migration uh, issue. We have identified uh, uh, how many of uh, the migrants uh, that he considers that will uh, remain in, in, in Colombia are within these 170 municipalities. And uh, we work so that uh, the long-term solutions that we are providing for in those municipalities, uh, taking account the impact that uh, the Venezuelans uh, will, uh, will have. Now, um, I will end up by, by mentioning that uh, um, Venezuelans and Colombians, we are exactly the same. There, there is no difference between Venezuelans and, and Colombians. 
So most of the, of the Venezuelans that uh, have migrated, uh, uh, they will uh, remain in, in Colombia. And therefore, if we are successful with uh, the PEDET planning, uh, this will be an opportunity for Colombia. But uh, if we uh, fail, and I'm not saying that uh, there is any possibility that we fail, but uh, if that was the case, then this will be uh, a threat because then we will have a, a additional people that uh, will be subject to a temptation of, uh, of narco-trafficking. Um, finally, um, I, was, uh, I will uh, emphasize that we have this, uh, what we call zonas futuro, future zones. These are the very uh, um, spotted places in the territory of Colombia where by reasons of security, we have uh, come to a conclusion that we need to work especially in the security uh, aspects and also um, accelerating the implementation of the PEDETE, PEDETE planning. This is something that, uh, that the security people in the government and uh, myself, we work uh, very, very jointly so that uh, it is not an independent response, but uh, something that is a uh, coherent migration, security and PEDETE implementation. Thank you very much. We have uh, two more uh, questions and I'll pose them to you both of you, and then have, uh, if you can fold them into your concluding remarks, we're about to close, and I'm going to go in reverse order. Uh, Emilio, I'll let you uh, respond first, and then I would like uh, Anastasia to, to provide some closing remarks. But the first question is, uh, in what way uh, will, do the PTEDs contribute to the opportunities and development that the former combatants might have? Uh, another question, is uh, Human Rights Watch recently issued a report expressing concerns that uh, combatant groups or armed groups are enforcing COVID-19 quarantine measures outside of the rule of law. Uh, and the question is, is, to what extent is the government, the Colombian government concerned about this and addressing this? Um, and then just for both of you and your concluding remarks, Emilio, if you can just talk a little bit about what is the role of the international community in all of this? What can we do collectively to help foster peace uh, in Colombia, in addition to obviously the support you mentioned from the UK and from the United States, but also intellectually in terms of public debate, in terms of solidarity. Um, and then Anastasia, just a, a thought from you in terms of what, is, what are the future challenges for Colombia, given your comparative perspective and theoretical and historical perspective? What to you, uh, given I think your, your deep understanding of the multiple challenges to peace and uh, post-conflict situations stemming from illicit markets, from irregular armies and from state failure. Uh, what, what, what should we collectively be thinking about, not just the Colombian government, but all of us in terms of the challenges? So Emilio, two questions and then reflections on the international community, please. Thank you. Um... I would, uh, I mean, um, we do understand that uh, the reincorporation process um, uh, is uh, crucial to the uh, 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 success of the implementation. Uh, it is not the area that will change uh, the face of Colombia. It is not the area where we will change uh, the reasons why uh, so many violences have been uh, possible. Um, I mean, um, to um, to have uh, an idea I mean, uh, of uh, these 170 municipalities, uh, it is, as I mentioned, one third of the Colombian territory, but it is just 15% uh, of, the, of the population. So the one characteristic that we have is that they are uh, territories that are uh, very dispersed. In, in areas uh, where you have a, a poverty, uh, non, uh, the state is not uh, that uh, that present, and uh, um, uh, illicit uh, activities that enables uh, the criminals not not just uh, to be criminals, but uh, the, in fact to take control of the territories. So in the in the long term, what we are what we need uh, to do is that we need to go there and we need to take control of the of the of the of the territories. 
if we are successful in, uh, in that, then we would have created uh, conditions that will permit the Colombia to be uh, uh, in peace. If that is not, uh, if that is not uh, the case, if we do not take advantage of this uh, long-term uh, one opportunity, then uh, they, we will have violence again. Uh, fueled by coca, fueled by marijuana, fueled by uh, illegal um, uh, mining, uh, you, uh, you, you, you name it. So um, uh, this is what I consider you know, to be what really will transform the, the face of, uh, the, the face of, uh, of, of Colombia. Um, supporting the, the, the ex-combats and getting the ex-combats uh, uh, to get uh, the reincorporation is necessary, but it's definitely not, uh, not enough. And uh, we need to work with them, but it is not for them that we are working. We are working for the Colombian, uh, for the Colombian people. We work with them, but not for the, for the, for them. And we, uh, I am sure that uh, if we continue to go in the in the line that uh, work that we have, we will be succeed. And uh, I have the two reasons to be uh, optimistic. One, uh, we made a very detailed census. We we asked them uh, a lot of questions. And one of those was, uh, how do you see your future? And more than 75% of the ex combats see their own future with optimism. That is uh, above the Colombian average, that is above the UK average, that is uh, above uh, the, the, the London, the London uh, average. Uh, and the, the second reason is that uh, uh, we had these uh, people uh, that appear in the video and uh, they expressly said that they will go back to uh, terrorism and narco trafficking and uh, they have catch they, they have uh, captured uh, very little uh, attention of the uh, of the ex combats so i will um, not worry a lot about that uh, in, uh, in, in what has to do with uh, the uh, international community and support, uh, I will, uh, I, I, I cannot, uh, um, uh, I, I cannot highlight uh, enough the importance of the, uh, the, the company and the support of the, of the international community. And uh, let me put this in, uh, in context. Uh, what we are doing, in many aspects are things that uh, Colombian people had knew that we needed to do very long time ago. It is not that uh, I am more intelligent than anybody that was in my position be before. This is something that, uh, that uh, many governments had tried to do uh, since at least uh, 60 years ago. But it is not something that can be done in a period of time of three years. So uh, someone will come to the office, will make a diagnosis, will say that uh, this is what needs to be done. They will put a name to the program and they will fail because they do not have uh, the time. Now we have this opportunity of doing it for uh, as long as it is needed in order to get the changes that need to be done. And having the uh, international community, uh, having an eye in what we are doing is very important because uh, then, uh, there, then uh, I mean the, the compromise of the Colombian the government and the Colombian people no, will endure for as long as it is, uh, it is needed. Uh, we uh, really appreciate the way that the, the international community has asked it, because uh, once they, we came to office, they asked what our priorities are, and uh, um, almost every uh, source of uh, support, that is the, the Europeans, the United uh, Kingdom, that is the, the multipurpose uh, um, uh, fund, they have all aligned uh, their priorities so that uh, they work in line with uh, what we are doing. Anastasia, just a few uh, remarks. If you had the ear of the presidential advisor on consolidation and stabilization and consolidation, which you do, what would you say uh, are some things to, to keep an eye out for in the future? Thank you so much. These are excellent questions. And I would like to highlight one thing. 
that armed groups are not simply fighting apparatuses. They are social and political organizations, even when they are primarily motivated by economic gains. This means that they play institutional roles and are embedded in populations in ways that go beyond mere violence. Um, these structures, especially when they're sustained over time, as in the case uh, in Colombia with ELN, for example, are very difficult to untangle. And this and other armed groups are now moving into areas that FARC once controlled and are establishing these patterns of government, these new rules, as has been demonstrated by, for example, enforcement of quarantine, which is an exercise in deepening what we call rebel governance. So state control is essential in this regard, but attention to local capacity and leadership is also critical, not only among communities, but also ex-combatants who are engaged in and can support the peace agreement by, for example, helping better understand the structure of violence, the structure of illegal economies in the country, and developing alternative structures and solutions to address these. Excellent. Thank you. That was a very succinct and, and uh, insightful and cogent uh, way to conclude. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank again the funders of the Latin American Initiative, Diageo, Fresnillo, HSBC, BTG Pactual, Wintershell DEA, Equinor, and Karen Energy, uh, as well as a number of the people on this uh, call who are instrumental in uh, creating the Latin American Initiative. Uh, thank you on my behalf and also I think if I can speak for this on behalf of many Latin Americans who now, uh, like Ambassador Ardila, have uh, feel that they have a voice uh, in Chatham House and in London. So thank you very much. I hope this conversation can continue. I think I uh, share uh, the sentiments of many people on this call. This was very important to hear this perspective and to continue this discussion, uh, even if it's done remotely, perhaps because it's done remotely. And uh, so please, thank you. We, if you can, just unmute yourselves briefly and applaud. Uh, and uh, we will then close at that and you can go about enjoying the rest of your Netflix queue to watch. So please, thank you very much. Thank you.